Um, before starting the talk, I just want to thank all the organizers and the volunteers for the amazing job that uh, they've done so far to uh, make this amazing conference possible. So really, thank you for your job. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, regulations uh, from a libertarian and strategic uh, perspective. Just a couple of words about myself before, uh, before I start with the talk. Uh, basically, my background is in uh, philosophy and uh, right now I work as a, a philosophy and history teacher. I'm also a libertarian, as you will see uh, later on in this talk, of the anarcho-capitalist and agorist variety. I'm also a member of the Monero Policy Working Group, which is basically a loose quorum of uh, individuals that uh, try to understand the impacts of regulations on, uh, on Monero and uh, sometimes also provides some very good uh, public material uh, um, in order to uh, foster the uh, public uh, discussion about, uh, about regulation. Um, the Monero Policy Working Group is uh, free for everyone to join, so if someone want, uh, wants to engage, uh, engage with it, uh, is more than welcome. And uh, importantly for this talk, I'm also not a lawyer, not a policymaker, not a computer geek, and not a technical guy. Basically, uh, basically I'm just an army, uh, which I think that uh, is kind of useful for, uh, for, uh, for, this call, uh, for this talk, because I want to tackle the issue, the very complex issue um, of regulations from the perspective of a common user. So, a quick summary uh, of, the, uh, of the presentation. First, I will do some KYR, which means uh, know your regulators, ju just to show that there are a lot of regulators out there. Then, I will distinguish between two kinds of regulations. First of all, regulations that are just an extension of traditional financial regulations, and then malicious regulations that, are, uh, that target the value proposition of cryptocurrencies like Monero. Also, I will spend uh, some words about blockchain analytics companies, which are private entities that uh, play a huge role in shaping the regulatory environment that we live in, and, uh, in order, uh, and it is important to understand the role of these kind of players. And I will end with some strategies that we can adopt in order to defend ourselves from these regulations. So, with regard to know your regulator, of course, we have uh, all in mind this kind of image of uh, shadowy super regulators. That are, um, regulation is a very complex topic. Uh, there are a lot of different parties and actors that, uh, uh, that uh, make the laws uh, uh, um, that uh, regard also, uh, also Monero. Of course, in Western democracy, we have national parliaments that uh, hold the legislative uh, power, but there are also national agency, like, uh, agencies, like for example, in the US, the FinCEN, OFAC, the SEC, uh, which are all unelected agencies and uh, bureaucratic agencies, and uh, that play a huge role both in shaping regulation and in enforcing them. And also there are intergovernmental uh, agencies, supranational agencies, uh, maybe the most famous for the Monero community is the Financial Action Task Force, uh, which is responsible for uh, uh, providing the guidelines uh, uh, with regard to uh, anti-money laundering and countering the financing of uh, uh, terrorism. And then these guidelines are implemented by national uh, governments in different uh, jurisdictions. And also, quite an obvious point, but there is a difference between draft legislation and actual legislation. We should always keep in mind this difference, uh, which is uh, something not obvious if we look at our Twitter feed or at clickbyte uh, website, like for example, Coindesk or uh, Cointelegraph. So please keep in mind that a draft is not a law. And also, of course, there are private players that, um, uh, that uh, work for profit, obviously, and that try to lobby regulators in order to pass laws that, are, uh, um, that uh, give them some kind of, a, of advantage. This is the case for exchange, exchanges, for example, or blockchain analytics companies, as we will see later. So, let's start with the first kind of, uh, uh, the first kind of regulations. Well, a very um, so uh, Satoshi is a very important uh, person uh, for, um, uh, for crypto uh, enthusiasts, but uh, he didn't invent money and uh, he didn't invent uh, the financial system. The financial industry is, a bas is basically a centuries, uh, centuries old industry and therefore there are already a lot of regulations in place and actually uh, the financial sector is probably the most regulated sector uh, in all the economy, at least in the West. So, 
it is only natural if you put yourself from the perspective of, uh, from the perspective of, a, of a government to want to try to extend these regulations also to a newborn industry like uh, the crypto industry. This is the case, for example, uh, for regulations against the financial crimes, uh, quote unquote, uh, like uh, money laundering or tax evasion. It is the case for security laws that deal with uh, investor and customer protection, uh, and protection. It is the case for regulation of money and banks. And a very important point, maybe the most important point with, uh, with regard to, with this kind of regulations, is that most of them target businesses that conduct activities on behalf of their customers. So it is important to understand that these regulations target intermediaries, third parties. And um, of course, there are consequences also for users, for uh, users like us, but their main target is, uh, is uh, these third parties. So please keep this in mind because I will come to that uh, in a couple of of minutes. I think that with regard to, uh, with this kind of regulations, there is not much to see here. Again, if you put yourself from, from the perspective of the state, uh, why shouldn't you want to regulate crypto banks or crypto intermediaries uh, in a similar way as you uh, regulate other kind of uh, uh, financial institutions? To be very clear, I'm not defending this kind of regulations. Actually, I think that they do a lot of harm and uh, they, do, uh, they do more harm than good and that they are responsible for a lot of the financial crisis that are, we are living nowadays. But still, if you are a government, you just want to regulate also the crypto industry in the same way that you regulate uh, the, tra the traditional financial industries. And also, let's face it, that most people that use cryptocurrencies don't really understand the value proposition of cryptocurrencies, and they treat, it, uh, they treat them just like investment to make more fiat money, and therefore uh, they just expect and demand the state protection of their money and assets deposited at financial institutions. Again, uh, again, I'm not defending this, uh, this kind of approach, but this is just the reality of, of what's going on uh, out there. So, how should we re re react to this kind of regulations? So, first of all, we need to understand the value proposition of cryptocurrencies, and in particular, the fact that there are two main features of cryptocurrencies that we need always to keep in mind, which are, of course, privacy and ownership. Um, there is a required reading about privacy, um, uh, which is very important, of course, the Bitcoin white paper, and in particular, section 10 of the Bitcoin white paper, when Satoshi is very clear in defining privacy in a different way from what happens in the financial system, privacy in Bitcoin and also uh, um, um and also in other cryptocurrencies is defined first and foremost like pseudonymity. On blockchain, you have a lot of data and metadata, uh, and metadata that can be read by everyone, that uh, are there for everyone to see, but this data is not related immediately to a real world identity. And it is important to understand that the traditional financial system is meant exactly to break pseudonymity. All the KYC stuff, for example, the KYC requirements that are in place when you, for example, sign up for, uh, for an exchange are meant exactly to break pseudonymity and to attach real world identities to uh, data that are on the, uh, the, uh, the, that is on, uh, on the blockchain. Also, Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Monero are not fiat money, uh, are supposed to be something different from, uh, from them. Fiat money, the fiat system, of course, is a system of credit and debt. So basically, there is always some kind of counterparty risk. For example, your money deposited at a bank uh, means that you are a creditor of the bank and that the bank is a debtor, uh, is basically just, uh, your debtor. But cryptocurrencies are not like fiat money, are not supposed to use through third parties, through counterparties and through intermediaries, are just more, are just more similar to gold and silver in this regard. Bitcoin, Monero, gold, silver are something that can be owned exclusively without asking permission to anyone. So, how should we react to this, to this kind of regulation? Well, we need to understand what cryptocurrencies are and we need to uh, use them appropriately. And therefore, we need to, um, uh, to avoid as much as possible the use of uh, custodial uh, services. So really just don't use them unless, of course, uh, it is really uh, necessary uh, to uh, do that. Of course, this is not a uh, a solution for uh, uh, all the problems that comes from regulations, but uh, given the fact that uh, traditional regulations target mostly third parties and intermediaries, it solves, uh, it solves uh, a lot of problems. Um, um, moving to uh, the second kind of regulations, uh, we uh, can see also that uh, regulators uh, try to 
also attack the value proposition of cryptocurrencies. This is the case, for example, for regulation that try to dry liquidity out of digital cash. Think, for example, about the more or less formal or informal pressure on uh, third parties to um, provide services uh, related, for example, to privacy coins like Monero. Or uh, think about uh, uh, regulatory attacks against the use of privacy-centric uh, crypto, uh, crypto tools. An example of that is the uh, OFAC sanction against uh, uh, Tornado Cash. If you want to dig into this question, you can watch a, a Monero Talk interview that uh, we had with DAC uh, last year, and then, of course, regulatory attacks against privacy. I will just give you an example of this third kind of uh, attack, and uh, I just want to provide you with uh, a quote by uh, Christine Lagarde, which is, of course, the head of the European Central Bank, and this quote is on privacy and the digital euro. Of course, it's not directly on Monero, but this kind of quote shows pretty well the approach of the malicious approach of some regulators when it comes to privacy in the crypto ecosystem. So, she states that uh, in our public consultation, 43% 40, of respondents ranked privacy as the most important important aspect of the digital euro well ahead of other features. And so we uh, as the ECB will do whatever it takes to uh, protect privacy, but there is always uh, a catch in this kind of uh, claims, but full anonymity such as offered by cash does not appear a viable op option in my, in my opinion. Why? Because of course full privacy and full anonymity enables crimes and you don't want to be criminals, so, so you should give up full anonymity. I think that this kind of uh, statement is uh, really a malicious attack against uh, some of the value proposition of, uh, uh, of uh, privacy-preserving cryptocurrencies like uh, Monero, and I think uh, and, and this is uh, because they are a form of doublespeak. Uh, doublespeak, of course, is a term uh, invented by George Orwell in 1984 and basically means the use of language to subvert reality. For example, the Big Brother in, uh, in, in 1984 states that war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. It's a, a sort of propaganda mantra, uh, mantra that is meant to subvert the, uh, uh, reality. And basically, what Lagarde is saying is that privacy means being uh, visible to regulators. We had a very beautiful talk this morning that showed that this is definitely not the case, that privacy is a sun, is a means to be invisible by default, means to be uh, able to choose voluntarily whether to reveal information to uh, some people, and that, uh, and that therefore invisibility should be uh, maintained by default, and visibility is just a choice of, uh, of the single individual. Uh, what Lagarde is stating uh, in, uh, in this kind of... Uh, in this kind of uh, uh, in, in this statement is just the opposite. She's saying that basically there needs to be some kind of backdoor um, thanks to which basically regulators can see transactions that happen uh, in the economy, but, uh, and that uh, in some particular cases uh, we, should protect, uh, 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 we should protect privacy, which is the exact opposite of what privacy uh, is. Privacy is being uh, invisible by default and not visible to regulators by default. So this is an example of a malicious attack. Also, um, with regard uh, to uh, another uh, very uh, interesting issue uh, with regard to regulation, we have blockchain analytics companies, which are basically private entities that work for profit and that uh, uh, play a huge role uh, in, uh, in shaping these, uh, the, these regulations. Basically, they can be understood as governmentalities. Go uh, governmentalities are just private entities that work for profit and that perform some state action. Uh, in this case, of course, they try to follow funds to track funds that are visible on a transparent or, or, or on, public, uh, on public, public blockchain. I think that the work of blockchain analytics company is a clear example of cronism, of corporativism, and of a bad mingling between a state function and a private function. Basically, blockchain analytics companies provide tra tracing software to government agency, regulated entities, law enforcement, and so on. They provide tracing software and not identification software. Remember that blockchains are meant to be pseudonymous and therefore the most they can do uh, is to follow funds on public blockchain but if they, and, uh, they are able to identify users only if they have third-party information, for example KYC information. So 
it is very important to understand the role of KYC in all of these kind of uh, regulations. So, blockchain analytics companies uh, try to track funds that are uh, on public blockchain, but blockchain through heuristic assumptions, but heuristic assumptions, we all know that uh, are just that, are just assumptions, are just educated guesses. We had another talk this morning, a very beautiful talk, that showed that uh, the most common assumption uh, among uh, blockchain analytics company, uh, the, uh, companies, the Common input, uh, uh, the common, uh, common input assumption can be broken even for transparent chain like Bitcoin through, for example, uh, conjoin uh, transactions. So all their assumptions, it is important to understand that can be broken and nevertheless uh, they sell these, uh, their services to law enforcement agency, regulated entities and so on and so forth. Also, these companies provide KYT software, which is Know Your Transaction software, which is closed source uh, and, and which is non-deterministic, and that uh, and basically its function is to flag uh, what it deems to be a suspicious transaction. Okay, so um, the problem is that uh, this software is basically obscure. Uh, users cannot know uh, which criteria are adopted to. Uh, to a uh, flag transactions, and therefore uh, th there is a lot of danger here because uh, the, um, uh, this kind of software, this kind of evidence, quote unquote, uh, can be used by, for example, by law enforcement to, to put people on trial or to uh, make people uh, appear in court or to put people in jail. So uh, all this is done through this obscure software that people are not able to verify. So, and uh, of course, uh, they sell this software for profit to government uh, and uh, I mean, we should really question this kind of b uh, business model, both from a legal pers perspective and from an ethical perspective. So basically, the relationship between uh, blockchain analytics companies on the one end and government uh, and the government on the other is a relation of scamming the scammer who longs to be scammed. So what do I mean with that? Basically, of course, the state is the um, mother of all, uh, of all scammers. Of course, it is the only institution on earth that can survive by stealing other, people pro uh, other people's property and by making this, uh, this, uh, this theft appear uh, beautiful and uh, legitimate. On the other end, blockchain analytics companies provide obscure software, closed source, uh, closed soft, uh, closed source uh, software that uh, uh, is based on educated guesses and, and uh, often they promise something that they cannot really realize. Think, for example, a couple of years ago, one of the major uh, blockchain analytics companies claimed uh, on social networks uh, to be able to track all Monero transactions, and of course, they didn't provide a single evidence for that. Um, but in this case, uh, blockchain analytics companies sell their services to governments and uh, uh, we need to understand, in my opinion, that uh, uh, the obscurity uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the software is a feature and not a bug from the, perspective, uh, uh, from the perspective of law enforcement and of the government. It is a feature and not a bug. But, uh, basically, I think that uh, government agency, more or less, at least someone in the uh, government sphere, know that uh, this kind of software is uh, somehow, uh, is, uh, somehow how flowed or uh, really cannot do what it promises to do. Uh, they know that and nevertheless, nevertheless they use it exactly because it is obscure. It mean, this means that basically uh, the um, uh, public prosecutors or law enforcement agency or regulated entities uh, enjoy a very big advantage over common users and over common individuals. Basically they can charge people, they can accuse people using uh, evidence that is not uh, really well understood uh, and they, and in this way, they can basically shift the, uh, the, the burden of, uh, of the proof on the users to prove uh, her innocence. So it's a very dangerous, uh, it's, it's a very dangerous point. So, what can we do in order to, uh, in order to try to uh, um, uh, make, this, uh, make the situation better? Well, the first, strategies, uh, the, the first strategy is to try to lobby regulators. Uh, it is to, uh, and th th there are uh, some, uh, some organizations that uh, do, do it right now. For example, Coin Center uh, is, a very, uh, is a very good organization. Uh, it is a no-profit and uh, tries to uh, shape the discussion, the public discussion about regulators in a very, um, in, um, in a good way. They try to nudge regulators in the right direction. Also, more informally, this is also the objective, uh, the, the objective of the Monero Policy Working Group. 
Of course, we, sh we should also uh, um, uh, face uh, the um, possibility that this kind of, lob uh, of lobbying doesn't work. And so, uh, how, uh, wh what is our plan B? Of course, our plan B is not the stock to flow ratio, but uh, is to uh, remember uh, uh, our origins. And of course, here we are in parallel Nepalis uh, and uh, near the Institute of Crypto Anarchy. So, it is important to uh, give a couple of quotes by, uh, from the Cypherpunks Manifesto and from the Crypto Anarchist, uh, Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. So, Eric Hughes, uh, Eric Hughes uh, talking, uh, talking about cypherpunks, states that cypherpunks write code and uh, that we don't really much care if you don't approve of the software that we write. Remember that uh, uh, privacy perceived cryptocurrencies like, like Monero are aimed to be, uh, are, uh, are supposed to be used in a permissionless way. And also, of course, we have Timothy May, uh, who states that, uh, who state that, of course, the government will try, uh, will try whatever it takes in order to try to stop the uh, spread of uh, crypto anarchy, but still, they will not uh, succeed. So there is uh, some hope in this regard. And uh, I want to conclude uh, with uh, the last slide, a uh, very, I think, uh, uh, Polish, uh, uh, Polish and uh, elegant and uh, measured slide, which is this one, and uh, we should really understand that in the end, uh, Monero should be understood as fuck you money. Of course, it's not the original fuck you money, this is Bitcoin, but maybe Monero can be even better than Bitcoin at being uh, this, kind, uh, uh, this kind of money. And uh, importantly, um, don't take me wrong, I think that this is very, it is very, very difficult to live up to this expectation. And uh, there is a lot of pressure on us if we go outside and we ask uh, some random people uh, that, uh, that maybe uh, no Monero for being tied to, uh, tied to criminals. Uh, well, uh, we know that uh, most people think that what we are doing is something like ena uh, enabling crimes. Okay. So there is a lot of pressure on us, and maybe uh, we, uh, we can be seen as the good guy, uh, as the bad guys, of course. And it is not easy to withstand that pressure. But on the other end, we shouldn't um, uh, make the mistake of uh, overestimating the, um, uh, the, um, the, control, uh, uh, the control and the power of, uh, of the government. Remember that the government, by definition, is an institution that uh, tries to um, um, uh, get away with market incentives, which makes the state an, an, inefficient, an inefficient actor. And uh, I think that the work that the people that are developing Monero right here, uh, uh, right now, and, uh, um, uh, and that are, are uh, in this room, are making a, a very good job in uh, trying to uh, exploit uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, inefficiencies uh, of uh, the government. So thank you for your job job and also thank you for uh, having me. Thanks.